Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good, good evening uh, to all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I had been traveling f for the past month. I left my home on March 3rd and I went to Saudi Arabia to perform Umrah and then I went to uh, Jerusalem. I visited the sacred sites for the world's three predominant religions, uh, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. And then uh, on Saturday, I went back to the United States, and on the same day, I took a flight back to Rome. So I have been uh, accumulating a lot of miles. It's an honor uh, to be here with you this evening, and my topic uh, is indeed a very important one. In light of what we have today uh, in the world, as a, result, as a result of speedy communication, as a result of speedy transportation, the world has become like a small village or a small town. Every and each and one of us, we somehow interact with each other through, so, uh, through social media, or through internet, or through other forms of communication, and we are curious to learn about each other. And the faith, as always, has been part of the human history. If you go back to the beginning of humanity, the very first human being, Adam, and the very first woman, Eve, his wife, Religion was part of their life, and consistently religion had been part of the human life from that time until today, and it will remain that way. However, we do have different views, and we do have different religions, and Islam respects that. Islam does not believe that everyone must be converted to Islam. And Islam, in fact, promotes this view, la ikraha fid deen. This is the verse of God. This is the speech of God. God himself said, la ikraha fid deen, that there is no compulsion in matters of religion. A religion is something that you choose by your heart. When God opens your heart to the guidance, to the truth, you accept it. You embrace it. If that has not happened for someone, then he will not be willing to embrace it. And you cannot force someone to accept a view. This is not something that Islam believes in. And for this, I would like to, I would like to take you back to the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. In comparison, when we compare the world's three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, Islam is the younger of three. Islam is about 1,400 years old, whereas Christianity is over 2,000 years old, and Judaism is about four, around 4,000 years old. However, Islam's foundation is the same foundation as the foundation of Christianity and Judaism. How and why? Because we are instructed to believe in these people and in these personalities that Jews and Christians also revere. Jews believe in Moses, in Jacob, in David, in Solomon, and Muslims are also instructed to believe in these prophets. Likewise, for Christians, Jesus is a personality that is the central figure in that religion. However, even among Christians, there are different schools of thought as to the reality of Prophet Jesus. We believe he was the, one of the greatest messengers of God, one of the greatest prophets of God. We, our, our Quran teaches us, Ulul Azmi min al Rusul. And Ulul Azm means one of the greatest messengers of God. Even among the prophets, Allah says, God says, Tilka Rusulu Faddalna Ba'dahum Alaba. 
that among the messengers there are some who have higher status in the sight of God than others. But only God makes that decision. Who has higher status and who has lower status? We as believers and we as followers do not have that authority to make distinctions that this prophet is better than that prophet or this messenger was better than that messenger. It is God's authority alone. So Islam gives us that teaching that we must respect others. We must respect others. And for Jews and Christians there, and all those who follow a divine scripture, there is a special term used in Quran, and that is Ahlul Kitab. Ahlul Kitab means the people of the book. And when you say the people of the book, it means that these people had the knowledge of the book, a divine scripture. And having the knowledge of divine scripture earns respect and earns a higher status among the ordinary people. So Islam gave these, the special status to Jews and Christians over others who did not believe in any God or who simply worshipped idols, as were the people of Mecca before Islam was introduced to them, as were the people of Arabia, as were the people of Persia, as were the people of many other parts of the world who simply either worshipped an idol or worship the star, or worship the sun, or worship the moon, or worship the trees, or worship something else. So Islam, Islam tried to create harmony. When Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, migrated from the city of Mecca to the city of Medina, he established an example of a multi-faith society. There were Jews living in that society, there were Christians living in that society, and now there were Muslims living in, the, in that society. And he created, a, he, he brought everyone living in that society, living in that community to an agreement to care for each other, to defend each other, and to respect each other. And that's what he showed for, from his examples as well. And he also taught us that you should treat others as you would like to be treated. لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه. None of you can truly believe, can perfectly believe, unless you like for others what you like for yourself. If you would like to be treated with respect, with honor, then you must treat others with respect and with honor as well. And no human being, no sound human being would like to be treated with disrespect and would like to be called names and would like to be humiliated and embarrassed. Likewise, when you have to deal with other people, regardless of their faith, regardless of their origin, regardless of their race, regardless of their color, regardless of their ethnicity, you must treat them with the same dignity and same respect that you would love to have for yourself as well. This is what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us. I wish we could some, there are universal values that we can all agree upon and we can all accept and embrace. But sometimes our self-interest come as an obstacle in, in between the universal interest for the humanity and our personal interest. And therefore, we abandon the interest of the humanity and we prefer the self-interest that will only benefit us. This is something that we should take as an evil. And we, whenever we pray to God, we say, Allahumma a'idna min shururi anfusina. O oh Allah, O oh our God, O oh our Master, O oh our Lord, protect us and save us from the evil of ourselves. We possess evil, evil in ourselves because the Satan, he's always trying to misguide us. He's always trying to mislead us. His knowledge is more than any person in the history of mankind. 
he's even older than Adam and Eve. Do you know that? Satan or the devil, he's older than Adam and Eve. And in terms of knowledge, yes, he has more knowledge. And in terms of experience, who could have more experience? He's been there before the beginning of mankind. So he has all the tools. He has all the skills. He has all the experience. He has all the knowledge to misguide us and to mislead us. On the other hand, what we have is the prayer of God. Our tool is only the prayer of God. We can ask God to save us from the evil and from the harm of Satan. And there, God has the power. God, of, God will always have the upper hand and he will always have more power. So this is one of the principles that we learn from the teachings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. La yu'minu ahadukum hatta yuhibba li akhihi ma yuhibbu li nafsi. That none of you can truly believe unless he likes for others what he would like for himself. And another principle I would like to bring to your attention is that al mu'minu man aminahu nas. A true believer is one from whose evil and from whose harm others are in safety, others are in protection. If other people are not safe from your hands, from your tongue, and from your physical strength, that means you're not one of the best people. You may be respected because of your might, because of your strength, but that's not a quality. That's a fear that you have put in the hearts of people. If people respect you for your character and for your morals and for your ethics, then that is the respect that you should long for. Not the respect that you may take from people because of force, on behalf of power, and on behalf of strength. And then the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, also said, that a true Muslim is someone from whose hands and from whose tongue others are safe. We, we can hurt people either through our tongue or through our hands. We can punch someone, we can slap someone, or we can swear at someone, we can curse someone, or we can say something very hurtful, something very mean to someone. And that will also cause pain in, in the hearts of that person. And if you are protecting others from the evil of your tongue and from the evil of your strength, then that means you are getting closer and closer to God. And if you are not, if people are not safe from you, if people are not protected from your, uh, from your harm and from evil, then there is a lot of work to be done. I would like to close my, my remarks in these words. The work that this Institute for Cultural Diplomacy is doing is one of the most noble work. And we're sitting in Rome. Rome has always had a great place in the hearts, minds, and history of humanity. Let's commit ourselves to make every effort to make this world a more peaceful place, a more harmonized place for the generations to come. Our generation or the generations before us may had not had the opportunity to unite around one goal. But in this, in this age of advanced technology and more readily available resources, maybe it is easier for us to unite around a noble cause, around a noble goal, and make it into a reality. Thank you very much.